it's time, uh, without any further ado, to go to our next session, um, Innovation Community, Stories from London, Medellin and Toronto. Uh, we're glad in this session to have uh, Paul Kutko for you, Alex Ryan, uh, Paulina Villa and Gavin Paul. Um, we're going to talk about uh, uh, emb uh, emblematic innovation hubs uh, and we're going to learn from them. So uh, without any further ado, uh, I'm sure that um, uh, we have everybody ready. I see uh, Paul here uh, right now. So uh, let's uh, dive into this session and, uh, and enjoy everybody. Great. Um, well, welcome. Yes, this is going to be a session uh, on innovation communities. We're um, going to showcase uh, three particular examples that we think are emblematic of uh, this notion of innovation communities, innovation districts, the area of innovation concept. So again, I'm Paul Kretko. I'm the president and CEO of Ann Arbor Spark. Ann Arbor Spark is a area of innovation uh, about 40 minutes west of Detroit uh, around the University of Michigan as its key anchor. Um, and I am the current chair of the ISAP board and I'm very honored uh, to be in that role. Um, what I wanted to share with you at the beginning though is that the, a key in evolution in our network's history of ISAP was the recognition by the ISAP board uh, around 2012 of, as Louis Sanz put it, of a new animal in the zoo um, in his usual humorous way. Um, not a self-contained science park, but an innovation district growing organically in a city or an area of innovation uh, encompassing a broad multi-jurisdictional area. So we, we've talked a lot already today about the science park's impact on its community. This is the other model in which uh, the Science Park wasn't the core, but um, a district was developed over time. So in fact, that is how I became involved in ISAP. I was recruited by Louis Sanz about 2012 as one of the first area of innovation members. Uh, and, and in our case was an innovation district, uh, area of innovation that began in 2005, uh, again, in the Ann Arbor, Michigan, USA region. For my uh, area of innovation, Ann Arbor Spark, this means that what we're involved in is an ongoing curated effort uh, of the quadruple helix. So the academic institutions, public sector companies, local and state government entities, and NGOs and foundations, all working together to build and maintain an innovative ecosystem in our city environment uh, and doing that entrepreneurially in creating new initiatives over time that respond to changing circumstances and what our innovative companies and talented individuals need. Um, our three speakers are going to share their experiences in building innovative communities. And they're gonna answer the question uh, that, that is very much present. Uh, what do we mean when we say an innovative community? So joining us today, are three tremendous individual leaders in their respective cities who have done great work um, in advancing uh, their innovative uh, ecosystem. Uh, we're gonna hear from Alex Ryan from Mars in Toronto, Canada. We're then going to hear from Paulina Villa from Ruta, Ruta N in Medellin, Colombia. And then Gavin Poole will be the cleanup here uh, from here East in London in the UK. Each is going to make a brief presentation of their community experience, and then we'll come back for a live Q&A. So thank you, and uh, looking forward to the presentations. Hello, I'm Alex Ryan, Senior Vice President of Partner Solutions Group at the Mars Discovery District. Mars is an urban innovation hub located in Toronto, which is Canada's largest city and one of the world's most diverse cities. We have five universities, six colleges, and eight research hospitals providing a very strong research base. Mars is strategically located in the downtown core between uh, our universities and the financial district and also between the city hall and the provincial legislature. Mars has 1.5 million square feet of real estate in our centre 
and we support 1,400 startups, which makes us North America's largest urban innovation hub. We have three divisions, our innovation hubs, our venture services, and our partner solutions. For our innovation hubs, um, the centre was opened in 2003 with our first tower at 400,000 square feet. Um, and our, the fourth tower was opened in 2013. Um, our total assets are valued at over $800 million and we have $67 million in annual revenues. The real estate is uh, tenancy is carefully curated to have a mix that brings together the entire innovation ecosystem from ventures to innovation nonprofits to global corporates uh, to research spaces. And this diversification has placed us well through the pandemic. Pre-pandemic, um, we had 600,000 people working in our centre every day, uh, 2,000 annual events and meetings, and 150,000 people passing through the building. An example of how we've activated the space to engage our local community is through Nui Blanche, which is an annual arts festival that occurs one night from dusk till dawn in the summer. We put together a multi-sensory art exhibit featuring contributions from Margaret Atwood and Daniel Lanois and featuring the solutions of 16 of our clean tech startups to the challenges of climate change. This generated 22,000 attendees through the night and 8.4 million in PR readership. On the venture services side, we focus on four strategic sectors where we have local strength in the ecosystem and potential to scale to solve global problems. These are health, clean tech, fintech and enterprise. Over the last decade, our venture services portfolio has experienced exponential growth in our capital raised revenue and jobs produced. The ecosystem has now matured to the point uh, where we need to help companies get to the next stage of growth. And to do that, we have launched Momentum, a multi-sector exclusive program to help the 53 companies we believe have the potential to reach $100 million in revenue in the next five years. On the partner solutions side, we um, offer our corporate and government partners three things. Uh, an opportunity to participate in our innovation ecosystem and learn the startup perspective, the uh, accelerating the adoption of technology, and inclusive innovation to solve complex challenges together. An example of our technology uh, innovation adoption is our innovation challenges. We won, ran one recently with Ontario Power Generation, uh, where three of our startups were able to solve their, their problems in workforce planning, um, inspection automation, and automated monitoring. And an example of our inclusive innovation is our Opportunity for All Youth program, which is getting 40,000 barrier youth into jobs by 2024 by building a, a coalition of employers um, who are able to generate um, access to a new pool of, of talent um, while also solving into a complex and important social problem. In summary, um, across all of the uh, the work we do with our innovation hubs, our venture services and our partner solutions. Uh, what the common theme is, it's about connecting people. Yes, the real estate is important. Yes, the technology is important, but the role of the hub is to bridge uh, groups that would not normally convene to accelerate the adoption of innovation for the benefit of society. Thank you. Hello, everybody. I will share with you today the journey of Medellin uh, and our experience of building community innovations. This is Medellin. Medellin is the second largest city of Colombia with 3.6 million people if we add up all the metropolitan area. This is a panoramic of the city. We are uh, in the middle of a, of a valley. And back in the 90s, uh, we were facing big challenges, mainly uh, drug-related violence and an economic crisis linked with that violence. And I will add up uh, also another challenge, which is the rapid deindustrialization de process that we were suffering because of global dynamics. These were the headlines 
uh, back then, all related uh, to terrorism, um, drugs, and fear, death. But uh, 30 years later, we are telling a completely different story. These are the headlines right now. They all talk about transformation and how to overcome this uh, tragic past into something new uh, for the people of, of Medellin through innovation mainly. What we discovered uh, was that we had to use innovation to transform our society because uh, if, we, if we wanted to reach competitiveness in a global scale, there wasn't another way of doing that. Uh, the only way was innovation and technology. So we called all the stakeholders of the society, academy in general, local government, uh, businesses, companies from all sizes participated in this conversation and the society in general uh, was together here joining efforts uh, to discover the roadmap for, for Medellin. The outcome of that conversation was the creation of Ruta N, which is a non-profit public organization at the municipality level that was created with the objective of helping the city to transform its economy into a knowledge-based economy. Uh, the first thing uh, we did was to create the Science, Technology and Innovation Plan. And it, it, it shows the roadmap between the region's potential, potential and the market opportunities and what we had to do in the middle to fill the gaps. We discovered uh, soon that we had to create an innovation ecosystem or a community in, in an artificial way because we didn't have a tradition of, of these topics in the city. So we started by analyzing innovation ecosystem, ecosystems ag across the globe uh, and, and we discovered that they all were around four pillars, talent, capital, infrastructure and networks. In the field of talent, um, we know that, that we have to make sure that we have the right talent for the companies that are, that are growing here. So we developed a city level strategy to create this constant flow of right brains in the field of capital or in the pillar of capital. We knew that we, as a city, we didn't have the resources, all the resources to fund this, these companies that were growing in the city. So we uh, called all investors in the country and we created a network of invest of investors, risk capital investors. And today that network uh, has more than 25 uh, members working together to fund the, the companies in the infrastructure. We knew that we had to uh, develop the right infrastructures to remove all obstacles for these companies to grow here. So we developed um, uh, an innovation district at the north part of the city. And this all come together to networks because the main mission for us is to connect all these dots together and to make sure that this uh, community or, or this ecosystem is running properly. So far we have more than uh, 350 companies from 32 countries around the world uh, working together in this ecosystem and they are creating more than 10,000 jobs more than almost 50% of the companies in Medellin are innovating right now and 27% uh, of jobs here in Medellin are related to, to innovation. But we knew that we had to do more uh, in terms of impact, in real impact in the quality of lives of all the citizens here. So I will set an example here with this initiative called Inspiramed. Uh, when COVID-19 hit the country, we knew that we were mainly in our own, that we had to, to, to develop our own solutions to that because the demand, the global demand was far more than the offer or the supply the, the world could uh, offer to the solution to the situation. So, so we, we, start, we started by seeing that probably that was the best scenario for us to develop a ventilator here. That was the first time in, in Colombian's history that we were trying to do, in, to do something like that. So we, we called the, uh, the, the ecosystem, the community, and we organized uh, our efforts in six fronts. 
to develop these uh, ventilators, companies from the all sizes and, and, and also public organizations respond. And this is the timeline of this story. Uh, we started in March developing prototypes with three uh, different uh, initiatives, one from a public university, one from a private university, and one from a startup. They were developing the prototypes, testing them. They had the final version by May. They, uh, we, then we called the big manufacturers here, one of white, white appliances, other from manufacturing cars, and other manufacturing motorcycles. And they all agreed to scale up manufacturing ventilators this time. We, we trained this, the healthcare staff. And now we are using those ventilators all over the country, even remote areas from Colombia have benefits, have benefit from that. These are all the organizations involved in this. Um, and we are very proud as a city of uh, proving that when you have a community organized, uh, they can collaborate to solve the big challenges. Um, and that's, that's the way we, we, we know that no matter the challenge we are facing, if we have a, a community organized to innovate, then we are going to overcome everything. That's why Medellin never stops. Good afternoon. My name is Gavin Paul and I'm the Chief Executive of Here East, which is a large million square foot campus on the middle of the Olympic Park. Um, here in London. Um, we've been building um, this campus now for over eight and a half years and our ambition is to create the UK's largest campus which is dedicated to innovation. You can see on the screen this location is uh, on the Olympic Park, home of London 2012, adjacent to amazing facilities of the parkland but the copper box multi-use arena, um, the stadium and the thriving uh, economic heartlands of um, around us in East London with Stratford and Hackneywick in a very creative, innovative um, area. The buildings you see uh, literally just um, in the middle of the screen with Here East on the roof were used as TV recording studios, broadcast studios and the home for all of the media during London 2012. And myself and colleagues put together a company and a bid to win the rights to develop these buildings uh, to create a new innovation district in the heart of London. We did this by using the characteristics of scale, as I said, it's over a million square feet, and the volume of this huge 10 meter floor to ceilings, great for laboratory and studio space, but also the fact that the area we live in is in a very creative environment, um, lots of studios, lots of digital businesses, but also just up the road was the epicenter of Tech City, when in 2010, the government at the time put a large focus on the growth of technology to support the rebooting of our economy after the 2008 global financial crisis. We've invested over £165 million on this journey. Um, you can see on the um, left-hand side um, of the screen, you can see what we had. It was basically a large shed, uh, which was the home, for, as I said, for all the broadcasters and studios. And we saw something in that to create a cluster of new fast growth businesses. We wanted to create a home where we could attract global businesses to let sit alongside international and homegrown startups. But amongst all of that, what we saw as being fundamentally important was to put in universities and high growth universities and education factored around research into business to support the growth of businesses we have on, on campus. And you can see on the right hand side, the transition we made between 2012 when we won the rights to develop the site through to 2016 when we launched the scheme and we've started to, to fill up, of which now we are over 75% full, which still leaves us over 300,000 square foot or 30,000 square meters to fill. Um, but we have a pipeline of activity even during the pandemic as people wanting to come to this part of London in this part of open space but to sit side by side with some of the international companies such as Ford, Matches Fashion, Sega, the universities like UCL, Loughborough University, but most importantly, alongside Plexor, our innovation center. 
It is a building. Um, it's actually three buildings that we've created. It's a, a multi-award winning best in class um, uh, design, uh, becoming what was being termed as the UK's first super campus. We have four universities uh, on site. We had uh, back in April over four and a half thousand people on site. Clearly that has been subdued since the crisis of the pandemic. Um, we're about 1200 on site on a daily basis at the moment. But it's also now highly regarded by the International Olympic Committee as probably the best legacy project for tech and innovation that the modern games has produced. It's a community as well, not just a community of the people who um, work or study at Hear East, but also the impact that a campus and an innovation district like ours can have in the wider community uh, can't be underestimated. And taking people on the journey is really important. So it doesn't feel like something has landed in their backyard, which they don't have any ownership or agency within. Uh, we, as I said, we've got over four and a half thousand people on campus normally, um, but actually we work further afield across London and the regions and now internationally. It's more of a movement as well. The people who choose to come here, not just the business leaders, but the students, those who are starting new businesses, really begin to indicate what it is to become an entrepreneur, what it is to be an innovator, and they have a passion for innovation through collaboration. And I think that's one thing that defines us is the way that we bring everybody together and we convene a lot of activities in our event space, but also business to businesses through the intervention of a management team dedicated to collaboration. To enable us to do that, we've built our own innovation center, central to our entire vision, uh, was a place where startups can come and grow, the likes of which London has never seen before, providing full services around legal, admin, finance, uh, to be able to provide the facilities for a company to grow into. And when they leave the Innovation Centre, they move more into the Here East traditional real estate um, site. And we see our very much as self as enablers to grow businesses and support the growth. And that's for as much for the multinationals like the Fords and Sagers and BTs as it is for the, the startups or two or three people with a great business plan looking to start a new technology business. Some of the things that we, you start to see how we've got community right in the, in the center where we've got innovation through Global Disability Innovation Hub, looking at the ways that we can uh, make the world a much more accessible place for people with disabilities but by using the means of the creative industries, and this one was through Skateboard, Skate USA, the Smithsonian and Innerskate. Uh, you can see the focus we've started to have now on esports and the growth of technology platforms and content platforms as that phenomenon takes hold across um, the world. But we have robotics labs, we have the Smart Mobility Living Lab, we have autonomous vehicle uh, research, um, you can see that our own robot being worked on in the middle uh, and the, the small houses you see on the top left of your screen is a local project um, on campus with 21 studios looking at micro businesses uh, in the tech and creative sectors for people who live um, in the local area, which has gone down exceptionally well. So our main emphasis is very much about looking at the opportunities and looking at the touch points where we can bring people together and to help export um, ideas from one business to another and promote growth. What we also have though within our innovation center is um, an innovation services provider and that is our own built consultancy working across the streams of mobility, cyber security and social inclusion and I think if you are convening and you are looking at collabor collaboration you need to be able to help them deliver on projects and so far Working with our national government, we've delivered over 20 million pounds worth of projects in three years, uh, specifically in cyber mobility and social inclusion, accelerated the growth of over 72 cyber businesses and are now looking for the future projects and the future businesses, which will help us support the technologies of tomorrow. So in a whistle stop tour um, of eight minutes, you can understand how we've been busying ourselves to build this ecosystem brand new from scratch on the Olympic Park in London. Thank you. Well, uh, impressive. Thank you, gentlemen. I, unfortunately, I believe that Paulina was not able to be able to connect with us on this live section. And uh, I would encourage any of you who are interested in what she's doing in Medellin that you contact her directly. 
um, and uh, she's more than happy to engage and tell you about her progress and in, in her insights. So gentlemen, I think one of the things I, I wanted to explore with you a little bit um, is uh, in discussions at the board level and in past conferences, we've talked about this continuum of science parks to broader areas of innovation as, as, as being a variety of ecosystems. And I think um, for many of our um, participants who are thinking about how can their science park have a greater impact on the surrounding community, how some that are involved in innovation districts are thinking about bringing different stakeholders to the table. I guess I'm curious at first about your, your both of your governance structure, because I think a lot of times for people who participate in these conferences, origin stories and structure is important for them to understand. So Alex, how are you organized? Is there a, is there a board? Um, how, do, how do the various stakeholders work with you um, to build the ecosystem? You're muted. Let me unmute. Uh, thank you, Paul. So um, yeah, so Mars has um, several legal entities. Um, we have the MDEI, the Mars Discovery um, Enterprises Inc., which is a for-profit real estate business. Um, that is part of um, Mars Discovery District, which is a registered charity and not-for-profit. So each year, the profits from our real estate business go into the charity. Um, we also have a, a separate not-for-profit, um, the Impact, the, the Investment Accelerator Fund, IAF, um, and that is our seed stage venture capital fund. So, so we, we have several different entities. Um, within MDD, the charity, we have a board, um, and that board includes, um, uh, is, is chaired by Annette Vershuren, who uh, runs um, one of our um, most promising startups um, in our ecosystem. Um, we have um, members of the community that represent the venture perspective, that represent venture capital, represent um, the corporates, um, represent um, all of the innovation ecosystem, as well as um, ex officio membership from the provincial government, who's been one of our big funders. So um, uh, also our founder, John Evans, um, one, of, one of his sons is on the board and also a, a CEO of, a, of an oil and gas company. So um, we have a broad representation in, in, in that governance. And so my, I'm just assuming, and this could be a yes or answer, I guess, or yes or no, is they help you frame strategy and think in the tactics that you are employing moving forward. Is that, do I have that right? Yeah, I, I think like the CEO and executive team is responsible for proposing the strategy. The board provides um, diligence and governance oversight. Okay, and in your case, Gavin, uh, how, how are you structured? Yeah, I mean, it's our, ours is a, a pure private sector um, company. It's it's a kind of a hybrid from a, a triple P. Uh, so our ultimate owner gave us a, or granted us a 200, soon to be a 900 year lease um, on the buildings is the legacy company who is responsible for the whole of the Olympic Park. Um, so we have various touch points and relationships um, with them on a, on a quarterly basis uh, as a board. Um, I'm responsible to our shareholders uh, and the investors from, and owners um, from the fund. Uh, and then I have a management board um, to look after the Here East Pure, the buildings, the lettings, the development and the value creation of the asset. From the Innovation Centre, there's a subsidiary or a secondary company that we have that sits under the Here East sort of umbrella. Uh, which I'm a, a, a director and board member of. And my colleague, who he and I set this all up, he's, he's the managing director of that entity and he runs all the innovation programs. He's built an innovation consultancy for us and he runs the center. So it brings in the government, brings in startups, looks at the accelerator programs, looks for opportunities and develops that out. So there's a separate board that sits now and then under the programs, for example, our cyber program, uh, which we've built the 72 cyber companies now looking at the best of the best program um, that has its own advisory board which has representatives from the government and of the wider cyber so we kind of cascade it down depending on 
what level of interaction we need and what specializations that, that we need. It sounds heavily bureaucratic, but it's very, very lean. And then the final thing that we do um, with all our customers, you know, I, I use the word customers, not tenants. So it's just the way that we approach them is that we have something called a strategic forum where we have the C-suite members from across the campus of all the businesses and university leaders on campus who sit down with us and help us um, formulate the direction that we believe the vision is taking us in. And we're usually five, eight years horizon scanning of future technology. And that's a really good ready reckoner because those, those companies that have decided to base themselves to here, these universities that are bringing together new students, international or domestic, onto campus are really interested in helping us shape the future and what other types of industries, what other types of sectors are they watching that they want to see you know, embedded within their own uh, products or services they have to offer. And that helps kind of guide us on the future of vision, but very similar to what Alex was saying, you know, the, the executive team, which I lead, responsible for putting forward the vision, ultimately we take it to our shareholders and owners for total buy-in and uh, to date, eight and a half years in, um, they committed in and they're very comfortable with the vision and give us our head to go and deliver against that. Great. Well, Paulina, welcome. Uh, I, we, were, we were concerned you wouldn't join us. I guess um, one of the things that you and I talked about when, when we got together was just how the, the fact that you had put together the organization enabled you to pull everybody together to respond as you did to COVID. So talk a little bit about, about how you were able to, to, to create that structure that was, was enabled you to respond so quickly. Well, the fact is that the organization was already created. I mean, we weren't starting from scratch. Uh, I, I told you that we had a certain tradition of working together in this innovation ecosystem. We already had a community, but we haven't activated a community like with a clear purpose yet. I mean, we were working together around projects and, and things like that, but uh, we didn't we haven't uh, faced a challenge like uh, like COVID-19 before. So when, when the pandemic uh, hit the country, what we did was, okay, we have this community uh, and we knew that we were in our own, that, that we, we couldn't rely on the national government or, or international organizations to solve our problem. Although all they were, uh, working together and um, we knew that we had to do something like uh, with this community so we called the community we said uh, hey the challenge is that we have to develop a ventilator for the first time in the country in less than two months <laughs> and that's that's where uh, the magic happened because a startup a private university and a public university respond the call and they started to develop uh, these prototypes uh, with the help of research groups and other organizations in the city. We all we, we placed like an open call of like for crowdfunding this, this initiative and the city respond, uh, private companies uh, put money in it. So at the end it was an effort or of more than 30 organizations in the city. And that was pretty powerful for us. And the result is that we could develop a, a ventilator here for the first time in the history of Colombia. Uh, and I know that this could see as a minor result, but for a city like Medellin in Colombia is big because we are not uh, we have, we have, we don't have this tradition of developing technology here. Uh, so, so it was huge. It was huge, and we could do it because we um, were like feeding this community before. So, um, we've got about five minutes left. I'd, I'd like each of you to comment about the the theme of the conference is the human factor. And I know in my work uh, in our innovation district here, 
more and more of our emphasis is on talent development and talent management, uh, helping our companies uh, in that regard. So I'd, I'd like each of you, and let's we can start and just go from Alan to uh, Polina to Gavin. To, uh, what what are you doing specifically in the area of the uh, talent? And it, part, it has different dimensions. I understand some of it is creating an environment that talent wants to be in. Some of it is actually reaching out and creating uh, connections to universities and to bring talent in place. So, Alex, you want to tee that one up, and then we'll go with the other two panelists. Thanks, Paul. Um, yeah, so we, we published a report, um, Talent Fuels Tech, a couple of years ago, um, doing an analysis of the talent ecosystem. We are fortunate in Toronto to have so many uh, local universities and colleges, um, as well as um, worked with the federal government on our immigration to, to really expedite that uh, the, the immigration um, visas for skilled workers. Um, and, and I think um, Trump's, Trump's immigration policy has been our biggest uh, uh, brain gain over the last four years. Um, but yeah, I think um, it is critical. Um, we have talent advisory. We work directly with our ventures to help them to secure tech, tech talent. Um, and we're also looking at, um, at, at creating a global visa for startups to base themselves in in canada we think that we can be a really good home to attract startups globally to 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 be headquartered in canada do you do you um just drill down a little bit do you focus at all on helping them find managerial and c-suite talent because many times startups that's what they need they don't need more low-level workers to use that phrase they do that do you do you do that kind of matching as well yeah, there's um so um the chief financial officer for a in Canada we find that that particular role um, is traditionally from an accounting background, whereas if you go to Silicon Valley, um, they they have a very different kind of background, and so that's a particular kind of talent. Um, the 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 kind of chief developing development officer. Mm -hmm. Um, those are kind of the roles. So is that the executive level talent, also fractional talent? How do you get access to resources that you may not need a, a full-time resource Correct. for? I understand, good. Well, you know, are you, are, how about you? Are you involved in, in helping to, to your companies find talent and nurture talent? Yes, yes. We have developed a strategy which has like uh, two sides, matching offer with demand. So we work with the companies that we have in, within our community to know the needs of their talent uh, from now to two years. And with that information, we activate the innovation, the, the education ecosystem in the city. So, so uh, for the talent they need in the short term, we activate uh, like an attraction program similar to what Alex was mentioning. And for the talent they need in the mid long term, so six months, six months to two years, what we do is to develop talent uh, in the city. Uh, we created a, a financial mechanism to, to fund that uh, training of, the, of this talent. So at the end, we make sure that all needs are covered uh, and those, that strategy is mainly focused right now in digital talent, all things that have to do with developing software. Uh, but right now we are the only city in Colombia doing that. So it's been so far so good. Okay, Gavin, we've got about 45 seconds. So what okay, are you? you know, uh, what, what, talent pipeline is number one important uh, when um, companies are looking to base themselves at Here East. It's, it, it's the recurring question that everybody asks us. What is the talent like in the area? How do I get access to them? How can you help us? And we employ uh, people to facilitate that as well, whether it's our community and partnerships manager through the universities. We've got people interested in esports. And uh, when you're looking um, at that, we've got now a university dedicated to esports to grow our own talent. So overall, it's about reaching into the community. And then <laughs> look at the clock. And then facilitating that for our customers. There we go. Very good. Thank you all. Tremendous uh, oh, presentations. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you all uh, for being on time with us, and thank you for the session. Uh, I saw some uh, 
some reactions, some emojis coming through in the stream, people finding the button. So they really appreciate what you were giving us. So thank you all again. And thank you, Paul, for, uh, for leading. You're making true on the word chairman, also in moderating this, uh, this session. So a uh, good job. And I, I know what I'm talking about, right? So uh, good job. And thank you all for your, for your time. We're going to continue into our, our next session.